Eastern Standard Time. Welcome to today's MedCan online seminar. Thank you to everyone for joining us. My name is Tanya Haas, and I'm the in-house writer at MedCan. Before I introduce our presenter today, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. First of all, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available at MedCan.com under MedCan Insights. That is our, web our website. There is the option to join us only by audio, and to do that, the number is on the screen and in the registration and reminder emails you, you have received. Regarding the audio, due to the volume of participants we have joining us today, which is wonderful, uh, and uh, um, we will be muting all the incoming audio to ensure clarity. So we will not hear you if you're asking questions. However, uh, there are, there, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, and we do encourage you to ask questions, please uh, check out your screen and you can see in the bottom left hand corner this area right circled here in red that is where you can put in your questions uh, so please submit them throughout the presentation and we will be monitoring them at the end of the presentation Dr. DeGiulio will have time to address a few of the submitted questions though please note it may not be possible to address all the questions today and finally, the information in this online seminar is for educational and information purposes only and is neither intended nor to be relied on, in, intended to be relied on nor to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, diagnosis or treatment. Now with all that being said, I am honored and excited to introduce our presenter today. Gina DiGiulio obtained her doctorate in psychology at the University of Ottawa and earned her a Master's in Law with a Health Specialization from Osgood Hall. Past professional appointments include Clinical Psychologist at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre, Lecturer in the Undergraduate and Graduate Programs at the University of Ottawa, Research Fellowships at the University of Ottawa and Adjunct Teaching Faculty at Queen's University, Clinical Psychologist in the Outpatient Mental Health Program at Markham Stovall Hospital, as well as Clinical Practicum Supervisor at York University. Here at MedCan, Dr. DiGiulio is the Director of Psychology. In her clinical practice, she sees clients for a wide range of conditions, including stress and anxiety, depression, and relationships counseling. She is often consulted on individual counseling, organizational psychology, as well as corporate wellness programs. Dr. DiGiulio, over to you. Thank you, Tanya. It's a pleasure to present today's MedCan online seminar. So today's presentation is called Managing Mindfulness in Your Daily Life. And one of the reasons why we're discussing this topic today is because mindfulness is rapidly emerging as being one of the most effective ways to manage stress. The number of Canadians reporting stress is rapidly increasing and the rates are rising significantly every year, which is concerning. Mindfulness can be an easy way for people to incorporate stress management techniques into their daily lives. So today we will discuss how to practice mindfulness as a stress management technique, but before we do, we'll discuss what stress actually is. So we'll review the three stages of stress, the signs and symptoms at each stage, the impact of sustained stress on health, stress management and self-care, and how to build resilience using mindfulness meditation. Okay, so what exactly is stress? We use this word all the time to describe how we're feeling, but what actually is it? So stress is a response to a change in the environment, and it can be either mental or physical, and it can be healthy versus unhealthy. So not all stress is bad. Okay, so some examples of, of healthy stress would be something that leads to improved performance. Okay. So think about an athlete who relies on intense workouts to improve their bodily functions in order to go faster or run farther or throw more accurately. So the workout itself is a change in the environment and the body hopefully responds to the workout by building more muscle mass or making the cardiovascular system work more efficiently etc. So this type of stress can be labeled as good stress because it leads to a good outcome. A unhealthy stress, on the other hand, leads to negative consequences. So stress in and of itself is not a problem on its own, but it's how you cope with it that matters. Okay, so the three stages of stress that we will review next are the alarm stage, resistance stage, and exhaustion stage. Stage one is the alarm stage. So this is your body saying to you, 
uh-oh, something is wrong. Something is going on, and I don't like it. Okay, this is also known as the fight, flight, or freeze response. So stage one, or the alarm response, is a natural alarm system that we all have. Okay, and this can be very helpful if it's activated in the appropriate circumstances. So this is activated when there is the perception of a perceived threat in the environment or something dangerous in the environment and a surge of hormones rushes through our bodies, namely cortisol and adrenaline are released and these fuel our body for a capacity for a response, or in other words, enhances our ability to respond to the stressor more efficiently. Uh, blood pressure rises, our heart uh, rate increases, we sweat, uh, rapid breathing occurs, or more shallow breathing, um, and a greater blood flow is sent to the arms and legs. So all of these things actually help us to deal with or cope with the quote unquote, dangerous situation at hand. Okay, and once the threat is gone, then the body is meant to return to a normal, relaxed state. Okay, so now we move to stage two. So if a stressful situation extends beyond about two to four weeks, then our bodies uh, enter the resistance stage of stress. And here is when our bodies begin to pay a pretty heavy price for trying to keep up with the demands at hand or trying to keep up with the stressors. So this stage is somewhat similar to the alarm stage, except that it's much longer. Um, and in terms of what happens to the body, exactly the same thing uh, happens as during the alarm stage, but sort of the hormone, um, hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, uh, blood pressure, et cetera, they're still very high at this stage, but not as high as in the alarm stage. So they reduce somewhat, but they're still uh, problematically high. Okay, so this stage happens if we don't find a way to cope with stress. Okay, so I'm going to present you an image in order to just uh, drive home it more clearly what happens during this stage. So resistance uh, stress is akin to a branch bending. So imagine a branch from a tree and take one end in your right hand and the other end in your left hand and begin to bend it. So the force from your hands is stress. In other words, a demand made upon the branch, in this case, to bend before breaking. And the bending of the branch is resistance. Okay, so during this, this phase, people can exhibit flexibility or adaptability to stress if they find a way of coping with the demands that are being placed upon them. But people can also fall prey to resistance if they don't adapt or cope. And this is when stress starts to really take a toll on our health. Okay, so at this stage, several negative consequences on our physical and mental health can occur. So in terms of our physical health, Resistance stress can cause an impact on our sleep, uh, predominantly lead to insomnia, can cause chest pain, fatigue, impairments in sexual desire or functioning, gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, skin conditions like psoriasis or acne, headaches, migraines, appetite changes, either increases or decreases, reduced immune functioning, muscle tension, and increased blood pressure. And resistance stress can also affect our mental health as well. So in terms of our mental health, it can cause irritability, anger, uh, memory impairments, restlessness, decreased motivation, impaired focus and concentration. And mind you, all of these are also symptoms of depression and anxiety, okay, of which stress can be a major risk factor for developing. And stress can also lead to behavioral changes, such as um, not enjoying things or pleasurable activities as much as one used to, Decreased productivity, relationship difficulties, smoking, drug, alcohol use or abuse, and withdrawing from other people. So all of this can then lead to the third stage of stress, which is exhaustion. <laughs> so exhaustion is literally when your body and or mind just cannot go on any longer. So serious health problems may occur as a result, either in terms of physical health, mental health impairments, or both. So what are the signs of exhaustion? The signs of exhaustion are feeling extremely tired, 
feeling guilty for neglecting various roles, poor focus and concentration, forgetfulness, um, emotions seem to be closer to the surface, so in other words, people might um, cry a little bit more easily or uh, feel a bit more irritable or anger more easily, um, become more emotionally sensitive and interpersonally sensitive, so someone maybe says something to you that is a bit upsetting, you might react uh, a bit more than you otherwise would, and then this feeling like your life is completely out of control. Okay, so let's move on to discussing some stress management techniques and things that you can do to cope with stress when you notice it appear. Well, first things first, you have to first identify what your sources of stress are. Okay, and then for each source of stress, ask yourself, how important is that stressor to me? And is this something that is under my control? If the stressor is not important to you, but it's under your control, then let it go. Okay? If the stressor is not important to you, and it's not under your control, then let it go as well, because it's literally not worth stressing about. Okay, so in other words, don't sweat the small stuff, especially if at the end of the day, the stressor isn't all that important to you or not really consequential in terms of impact on your life. Now, on the other hand, if the stressor is important to you and it's something that is within your control, then address or do something about it. In other words, take action against the stressor. And if the stressor is important but it's not under your control, then you have to engage in stress management techniques in order to cope with the stressor that you can't change. So in other words, if you can't change the situation, then you have to change how you react to it. When a stressor is not within your control, this is when self-care becomes especially important. It's imperative, actually. It's one of the most important things that you can do in order to help cope with stress. And, you know, people often feel guilty when they engage in self-care activities. They either think that they're being indulgent or that they're selfish practices. And, you know, many times we focus on others first instead of ourselves, especially when we're really busy. Um, you know, it's common to hear, and I'm so busy, I don't have time for myself. Um, but self-care is helpful to other people as well because you can't serve from an empty gas tank and you can't actually be helpful to other people if you're not taking care of yourself first. Or you have to be sort of a best version of yourself in order to be helpful to others. So self-care doesn't have to be anything that's overly time-consuming or costly. So some things that you can do to engage in self-care at home are for those of you who work, uh, decompress after work. So make sure that you're doing something that clearly delineates your work day versus your home life. Okay, put effort into maintaining relationships. It's very common when people are extremely busy not to see their friends as often or to neglect family members or, or not pay as much attention to their partners. But we know that having intact uh, social support having a rich social support network is actually protective against stress. So it's when we are stressed that is most important to actually continue to invest in these relationships and keep them going. Okay, reduce screen time. So iPads, TVs, cell phones, et cetera. Okay, they actually take away from separating, especially work from home. Um, exercise. Exercise is one of the best things that you can do to help manage stress. It truly functions um, just as well as medication can. If you have a lot of chores to do at home, okay, prioritize them. Think about what you really have to do versus what can wait and just let some of them go because all chores are not equally important. Learn to say no to others. This is an important one. So it's especially important for us to maintain healthy boundaries uh, from others, especially those who might be more demanding of our time and our resources. It's especially important to do that when we're feeling stressed. And so every time you say yes to somebody else, you're actually saying no to something. So think about what you're actually saying no to, especially if you're saying no to yourself. Ask for help. Okay, there's no weakness in asking for help. Every single person needs some help at some time in their lives. So when you're stressed, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, try and maintain a regular sleep-wake 
cycle. And it's very important to maintain regular sleep when you're stressed. And very importantly, put yourself first. It is not irresponsible to do so, but responsible. Some self-care activities that you can engage in at work include taking breaks. Okay, taking a break every 10 minutes, um, sorry, a 10 minute break every couple of hours and making sure to take your lunch are especially important. At the end of the day, okay, you can just spend five minutes or so thinking about and setting realistic priorities for the next day. Rather than thinking about what you have to do at work the next day when you're at home, or even worse, thinking about this when you're in bed trying to fall asleep. Okay, turn off all devices after work. So in other words, don't be available 24-7. It's not healthy. Um, at work, try and respond to emails during scheduled times only. So for example, maybe every hour at the top of the hour or every couple of hours if that's feasible. Learn to say no, because that's especially important and equally important as, um, at work as it is in your personal life. Ask for help, also very important. Speak to a colleague or a manager that you feel is supportive about how you're feeling, if you're feeling stressed, and ask whether or not uh, there are any resources that might be available to you or any short-term or long-term accommodations that can be made. Okay, everybody experiences stress from time to time. So stress, stress is an inevitable part of life. Resilient people, however, experience stress, but they quickly bounce back. So they're like elastic bands that stretch, but then quickly return to their state before they were stretched. Okay, so let's look a bit more into resilience. So there are two empirically valid ways to build resilience. One is cognitive behavior therapy, otherwise known as CBT. Now this is a specific type of therapy that focuses on changing problematic thought patterns or behaviors uh, or responses to stress and stressors. It takes a problem-solving approach. It's a very action-oriented therapy and it focuses on building resources. And another technique, empirically validated, is called mindfulness-based stress reduction, or otherwise known as MBSR. Okay, so what is MBSR? Well, there are different forms of mindfulness-based stress reduction strategies, but the most researched and studied is called mindfulness meditation. The focus of this particular type of meditation is for the individual to gain awareness about things that cause one stress and to help build resilience or improve how one reacts to those causes when triggered. Okay, so what is mindfulness meditation more specifically about? It's about learning to attend to how one is feeling, both in terms of physical sensations, perceptions, mood states, thoughts, images, emotions, all of the above. So learning to attend to how you are feeling and bringing that feeling into conscious awareness, but without judgment. Okay, so it's awareness without judgment. And observation of symptoms is key. But again, without making any judgment or any evaluation about those symptoms. Okay, the focus is very much on the here and now. Okay, so when we're stressed, we may feel anxious or sad. Um, anxious thinking, if you think about it, it's anchored or tends to be anchored in the future, right? Because if you think about, well, anxious thinking or worries or all the what ifs. We're often thinking about things that haven't happened yet or might happen, right, et cetera. Depressed thinking, on the other hand, tends to be focused in the past, right? Depressed people tend to ruminate, for example, about um, things that they did or things they wish they could have done differently or they feel guilty about past events, etc. So with both anxious and depressed thinking, the thinking is not anchored in the here and now. Right? So mindfulness meditation is a way of helping people to re-anchor their thinking to the present. And this is really important because if you think about it, the present is where we experience positive emotions uh, more readily. It's, in other words, it's where all the good stuff happens. Um, and you can't experience pleasure or joy as much if your thinking is oriented in either the past or the present. The past, rather. 
Okay, so there are different types of mindfulness meditation practices. One is called mindfulness, and that is the practice that I just described. So being fully aware of what's going on in terms of how you're feeling without judgment. There is the body scan meditation. So this is where somebody is trained to pay attention to how they're feeling in terms of their physical sensations, literally from their head all the way down to their toes, um, to be fully aware of those physical sensations, again, without any judgment. And this particular type of practice can be really helpful to help people cope with pain or discomfort, um, and it helps people diagnosed with chronic illness to accept their pain better. Then we have progressive muscle relaxation, or PMR. This is where we learn to recognize um, when our muscles are tense and how to relax them as soon as we notice that they're tensing in the face of a stressor. Uh, mindful eating is another practice, so that is really sort of attending to what you are eating, the textures, the flavors, uh, as opposed to, for example, just you know, chomping your food down as many of us do when we're really busy or stressed, um, or not eating, as some people also do when uh, they are coping with anxiety or stress. And then lastly, a technique called the mindfulness circle. So this type of meditation practice focuses more specifically on breathing and awareness of breathing and teaches people to attend to their rhythm of breathing. And if they become distracted from that, uh, attention to bring the attention back to noticing breathing, but again, without any judgment for having veered off course. Okay, so there are many benefits of mindfulness. So it builds resilience, as we just discussed, but it also stimulates creativity and specifically encourages divergent thinking. It helps with problem solving. So in other words, it helps people to do something about the situation at hand. It also heightens emotional intelligence or helps people better regulate their emotions, um, helps increase patience and develop empathy towards others. It helps improve focus and concentration, helps to sort of cut out the noise that we have in our brain. Um, our brain is made up mostly of, of nonsense, really. About 80% <laughs> of what we think about is nonsense. And our mind wanders about 50% of the time. So mindfulness meditation can really help to sort of weed out the nonsense and help discard unimportant information and focus on what actually really matters. Okay, some fascinating research is being conducted on the impact of mindfulness meditation on the brain. So I'd like to share some of that research with you now. So the amygdala, and for those of you who are following along on the slide, that's the red dot just in the sort of midbrain. Okay, the amygdala is the part of the brain that's responsible for our emotions, especially our basic primal ones like anxiety and fear. When we're stressed, the amygdala actually lights up okay, and it activates neuronal pathways in the brain and it signals to the brain that it is under stress or it signals to the brain that it is scared or sad and it sends these signals to other parts of the brain as well. Okay, so really sends those messages kind of far and wide in the brain. Mindfulness meditation does two things to the brain. One, it quiets the amygdala so that it doesn't light up as much or send those emotional messages to the rest of the brain. And number two, it strengthens and even creates new pathways from the amygdala to the front of the brain. So that's that larger arrow that you're seeing. Okay. And this is significant because the front of the brain is what psychologists call the seat of executive function. This is the area of the brain that's responsible for decision making, judgment, focus, concentration. Okay, so in other words, these are all of the things that you need in order to take action against a stressor or to do something about it. Okay, so mindfulness can literally create a sort of mindful new pathway in the brain. Um, and the more we use this new pathway, the more it becomes our norm and our default way of thinking or coping with stress. Okay, 
but, and this is important, so in order to gain these brain benefits that I just showed you, you must practice mindfulness meditation every single day. So practicing it once or twice a week is, is not going to be helpful at all. Okay, every single day. So it's like exercising a muscle, right, or learning a new skill. It strengthens the more you use it. Okay, and if you sort of take nothing else from today's presentation, remember this. So mindfulness can be a preventative and really, really efficacious stress management option. Again, it's nothing that has to be overly time consuming. Uh, the research suggests that all you need in order to gain those brain benefits, in order to more effectively cope with stress, is 10 minutes of daily practice a day. That's it. 10 minutes. Everybody can carve 10 minutes out for themselves. It uh, doesn't matter how busy you are. Recognize the early warning signs of stress and make sure to intervene early. Okay, similarly to our physical health, the earlier we intervene, the better. Such is true of our mental health as well. Create time and space to focus on you. Ask for help when you need it. Okay, don't shy away from that. Make yourself a priority and take care of your wellness needs and learn to build resilience through mindfulness meditation or CBT to help you better cope with stress. This year, here are some helpful resources that you can turn to if you're either experiencing stress currently or contending with anxiety or would like to learn more about how to maintain good mental health. I'll just direct you to the last two. Um, these are two mindfulness meditation apps that I often recommend to my clients. And Headspace in particular, um, I really like because it has... Uh, 10 different scripts that you can listen to, so one for sort of every day and then the cycle repeats, and each script is only 10 minutes long. So all you have to do is find 10 minutes and listen to someone literally talking to you and talking to you about how to be mindful. Okay, it's um, a really great app. And for those of you who are not sort of smartphone savvy, uh, there's a desktop version as well. And here are some additional resources for you, um, some readings on resiliency or how to manage stress to create balance in your life. So that is it for my portion of the seminar. I will turn it back over to our host, Kenya. Thank you so much, Dr. DiGiulio. Uh, wow, there was so much in there. And so for anyone who would like to see this presentation again, we will have it on uh, our website uh, in the coming week. And uh, so for those who are joining us by audio, uh, you will be able to read those resources in print. I'm going to, we're going to uh, go to our question period in just a moment. If you have not submitted any questions, you can do so now in the bottom left corner of your screen. Dr. DiGiulio and I will get to questions uh, right after I speak to some relevant services here at MedCan, where we believe mental health is a critical component of overall wellness. MedCan psychologists can help you overcome obstacles such as stress, depression, self-esteem, relationships, and workplace challenges. We do this by helping you assess your current symptoms, develop a plan tailored to your specific needs, communicate effectively to help build a strong support system, learn best practices to better manage and build resiliency against stress, as Dr. DiGiulio spoke about. And MedCan psychologists focus on helping clients affect change by managing and overcoming challenges in a constructive and positive manner. If you are interested in learning more, please visit MedCan.com or give us a call. Everyone who joined us today will be receiving a survey, and this is one of our first online seminars, and we, we very much value your feedback. All right, so Dr. DiGiulio, uh, we do have a, a number of questions, so let's get right to them. Okay, so I see that one of the first questions is, when do I know my signs or symptoms are severe enough to see someone? Okay, that's a great question. Um, ideally, you wouldn't wait to even ask that question, right? So as soon as you notice, uh, maybe you're having some difficulties coping with stress, then I'd recommend, of course, speaking you know, to a healthcare practitioner. Um, early prevention is is always key and early intervention is key. Um, failing that or if that's not possible, then I would suggest speaking to somebody when you feel that you're either having a hard time coping with okay. the symptoms or coping on your own um, or when you find that the 
symptoms are interfering with your life in some meaningful fashion, so and causing you some impairment. And sometimes some people don't know what they don't know, so are there kind of external factors or maybe friends asking you or how are you doing or something like yeah, that? Yeah, there tend to be signs, right, from, from external signs. Uh, people maybe are noticing uh, that you're different or that you've changed or expressing uh, you know, concern, asking you about your well-being, um, those might also be some signs that it might be helpful to talk to somebody about how you're feeling. Okay. Another question we have is, when is medication necessary? Okay. That's a good question. It's a loaded question. I'll try to answer it in 60 seconds or less. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So what I tell my clients is that medication can be a helpful tool for some people. Um, it was a tool that they can keep in their stress management toolbox. It's not going to take away all your stress or anxiety uh, on its own. I, I mean, I wish it was that easy, but for some people it can be a really nice complement um, to other types of therapies as well. Medications don't work for everybody. The response rate is about 60 to 70 percent, and often uh, when people try an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, um, it often doesn't work the first time and they'll have to try two or three times before they get one that fits. So I wouldn't recommend just medication on its own, but as part of an overall um, treatment package. Okay. It can be helpful for, for some people. All right, let's go to our next question. Is it possible for a person to use these methods of managing stress to control their anxiety and depression um, that they are currently being medicated for? So that would kind of be a lead in from what you just spoke about. So if if someone is on medication, can they start adapting adopt some of these practices that you spoke to? Absolutely. I mean, uh, something else I tell my patients is um, what, where medication can be helpful uh, when it works is that it can help to reduce, say, overall levels of anxiety or increase mood such that it's then easier to engage in these stress management techniques that we spoke about today. Okay, so that's going to be really helpful and again a nice complement mm -hmm. um, to other types of therapies or stress management techniques. Okay, thank you. Now, um, someone is asking about this mindful circle you had mentioned as one of the types of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Is this a group activity or is it an individual activity? What is it? No, um, I mean, there are mindful circles okay. that happen in groups for sure. Um, there's some centers in Toronto that do it, but no, this is something that you can do just completely on your own. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't even have to be 10 minutes. It could be just five minutes. So you're just attending to how you are breathing. Mm -hmm. Notice if you're breathing more rapidly, if you're breathing softly. Okay, so the breath is used as a vehicle for helping t the person to focus on the here and now. In this case, the here and now being how they're breathing. Okay. okay so it's definitely something you can do on your own. So, I mean, a lot of these are learned. You oftentimes have to go to classes and sign up for 10-week classes. Is that what you recommend to your, your clients? Uh, some people like the group format. Uh, some people don't. So I practice MBSR with, with many of my clients, and those who prefer to do so individually uh, will see me as opposed to taking a class or a workshop. But there certainly are uh, several centers in Toronto that offer uh, group classes if that's a format that you prefer. Perfect. Now we have a question regarding some nutritional aspect. Um, which of the vitamin Bs are best to alleviate stress? Well, I'm not a nutritionist, so I can't speak to this, but what I sort of can relay back is what I know from the research. Um, the B complex, um, specifically B12s are important because uh, deficiencies in B12 can mimic anxiety and can actually induce panic attacks. So for anxiety, the B12 is especially important uh, to have checked to make sure that you know, the, the levels are correct because if decreased, um, yes, can mimic symptoms of anxiety. Okay, and I think we'll have to wrap up shortly, but here's another question. To what degree is MBSR or other stress techniques being brought into workplaces? Okay, so increasingly, uh, MBSR is being brought into workplaces more and more. There's just uh, a greater awareness about mindfulness-based um, reduction strategies, and it's 
interestingly, some really innovative things are being done um, in the corporate world in terms of um, using these strategies and these techniques. Uh, Harvard Business Review recently published an article on how MBSR can be very helpful for executives and they've sort of listed several companies, this is mind you in the United States, that are now using and training their executives on these practices because then they're able to be more resilient, deal with stress better, be more empathic towards their employees. Um, interestingly, in the United States, MBSR is also being used to train military personnel. Um, so it's being used increasingly more and more in various uh, environments uh, as awareness about it um, increases. Well, thank you so much, Dr. DiGiulio. This has been an incredibly educational and inspiring uh, experience. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And uh, please be sure to check out medcan.com uh, for this and other opportunities. Thank you, and have a good night.